This is coal. Well, I- coal-fired power plants. Furthest time of the day in a coal mine. And it's got a long history, like millions of years long. No, no, even before dinosaurs. Coal formation primarily occurred during the Carboniferous period, roughly 300 million years ago. The world was covered in swampy forests, and as plants died, they were buried under water and soil, which led to perfect conditions without oxygen to create peat. This layer of carbon-rich peat then transformed into coal over millions of years from the heat and pressure of Earth's core. Humans have been using coal for thousands of years, but things really heated up in the Industrial Revolution when we started burning it at scale to generate electricity. Today, there are nearly 7,000 coal mines around the world. And burning coal is the single largest source of CO2 emissions globally. But what if we were able to capture carbon from the atmosphere, trap it, and lock it back underground? Maybe in the same coal mines that we dug out in the first place. That's what's possible with this, biochar. And it can actually do a lot more than capture carbon. What is biochar? Biochar is any biomass, be it wood, grassy materials, biosolids, like manure, uh, that's heated in the absence of oxygen. That's Jim Doton, the king of biochar in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he's leading the first ever city-owned biochar facility in the U.S. And it changes the chemistry of the carbon composition into a more stable form that lasts for a longer time and interacts with the environment, helps plants grow, cleans water, can decarbonize concrete, a number of other benefits. This is going to be the future site of the Minneapolis Biochar Production Facility. It's the first municipally owned and operated biochar facility in North America. And we were one of the first, if not the first, North American city to actually develop a biochar program. Until a few weeks ago, I couldn't even tell you the difference between coal and charcoal, let alone what biochar even was. So let's break it down. We have coal, 300 million years old, a fossil fuel. It's mined in the earth and then burned for electricity city generation. Charcoal, however, is man-made by slowly burning wood in the absence of oxygen. Then it's used primarily for cooking and heating, along with a slew of other uses like in toothpaste and cosmetics, medicine, etc. Finally, we have biochar, which is far more similar to charcoal, but it captures carbon during the heating process. The common thread is that they're all formed using heat and a lack of oxygen. But while coal and charcoal emit CO2, biochar traps it in the heating process. Trees collect wood or collect carbon, change it into wood, but then they die. What happens? Cycles right back up into the atmosphere over a period of time. So they're great collectors, but long-term storage, its that's where we run into trouble. What we're doing is here is harvesting that wood when the tree dies and changing its form so that it'll last for hundreds to thousands of years and locking up to two to three times its uh, weight in uh, carbon dioxide equivalents, basically permanently removed from the cycle, geologically removed. Here's where it gets really interesting. Humans have actually known how valuable biochar is for over 2,000 years. Pre-colonization, early Amazonian communities started burning and burying food waste, which led to extremely rich soil now known as terra preta, which is Portuguese for black soil. When colonizers arrived, indigenous farming knowledge was lost along with the early civilizations, and it wasn't until the 1900s that archaeologists rediscovered the Amazonian terra preta and realized it was human-made. This area of soil in the Amazon is actually so valuable that it's a protected archaeological site. But it hasn't stopped scientists and private companies from back engineering the process to create modern day biochar. Four years ago is when I decided to start Carba. This is Andrew Jones, the CEO of Carba, one of over 400 companies now working on biochar. And so I said, Paul, you know, let's figure out if there's a scalable, sustainable solution for removing carbon from the atmosphere. We're attracted in the end to what we thought was sort of the simplest, most energy efficient and lowest cost approach to removing carbon dioxide, which is taking waste material, um, organic material like organic food waste, agricultural waste, forestry wastes, and converting that into a charcoal or biochar, if you will, uh, through a heating process. And they're not alone. There are a lot of companies doing pyrolysis or biochar, and there have been forever. Pyrolysis, you know, in my opinion, is the best technology for locking up carbon. 
While cities like Minneapolis are taking steps to reduce their carbon footprint and make use of local resources like fallen trees, startups are innovating with smarter kilns, mobile pyrolysis units, biochar-enhanced compost solutions, and improving carbon removal tactics. It's this carbon removal part that's caught the eye of major companies like Google and Microsoft, who just this year invested in biochar-based carbon removal projects. However, despite biochar being responsible for over 80% of carbon credit deliveries, it makes up only 2.6% of total climate tech investment. Right now, there's a lot of money being funneled into speculative carbon capture technologies that are still years away from being a reality versus biochar, which is ready and available today. Biochar is punched way above its weight. So why isn't it getting the investment it deserves? And why am I only hearing about it now? A mature prairie can hold more carbon than a forest can. Really? It's just hard to see because it's underground. But the role of soil in, in carbon sequestration is underappreciated. What really makes biochar unique is how many challenges it touches at once. Soil health, food security, waste management, climate resilience. It's not a silver bullet. No single solution will solve the climate crisis, but it is a tool that's ready now and it's scalable and supported by centuries of real world evidence. It turns out the future isn't just high tech. Sometimes it's really, really old and buried in the ground.